Have you ever wondered to yourself, what would it be like to be a pilot in the First World War? Or better yet, what it would be like to be in history's first dogfight? Well today, we talk about the dawn of dogfighting. Ever since the Wright brothers took flight in 1903, pretty much every military in the world nut over the concept of fast-moving attack or recon craft, but early attempts to achieve this were, to be honest, really, really quite terrible. No one had really achieved anything as remarkable as the Wright brothers had until the dawn of 1910. Up until that point, any decent production of military aircraft beyond bad year blimps, and even then that's being courteous given how the French thought planes were overhyped toys for military usage, were garbage. However, come 1910 several aircraft made their heyday, and come 1911, the first reported cases of airplanes being used in warfare began. Italian pilots flying German-made Taube-class machines dropped hand grenades onto Ottoman trenches, whether or not they killed anyone is still kind of debated. Regardless if they did though, it showed a lot of European powers the abilities airplanes could achieve. However, the Kickstarter and crossover event of the century had arrived, and after a Serb got lazy and blew away an Austrian Duke Europe went into war for the 65 billionth time of its history. This would be where aircraft would begin their military heyday. Most aircraft were designated into two roles, Recon Air or Bomber Air. Bomber Air flew some dark bombs or grenades over targets and turned them into human jelly, whilst Recon Air would snap some good old sexy pics of your positions to give to artillery for them to then shell you to a new dimension. It was usually seen that Recon Air were the bigger threats, because unlike observation balloons which can't run away, but rather just sit there and die when attacked, Recon Air snaps a few pics, usually flips you the bird and just as you and the Kaiser's best man are drinking your corn brew a good old 155mm shell lands in your camp and turns you into confetti. Pilots however, needed flights to be light, and first generation air lacked decent firepower against other aircraft, so pilots improvised with handguns, the occasional brick toss, a smile and a wave. Smile and wave. rope to throw into the enemy's rotors, or a grappling hook to hit the enemy pilot or rotors with. As you can tell, the means were rather primitive, and until the Battle of Serre in August of 1914, that's what was seen in air war. Serbian pilot Majadreg Tomic encountered an Austro-Hungarian scout plane on his own recon mission over Austrian positions. The Austrian pilot and Tomic waved to each other before the Austrian pilot pulled out his revolver and took a series of pot shots at Tomic. <laughs> both sides returned back to base, and within a couple of weeks both sides ham-fistedly improvised machine gun pintle mounts to the top of their aircraft. The, the first air-to-air -air kill came in the same month, when Russian pilot Pyotr Nesterov saw an Austrian two-seat bomber approaching a Russian convoy, and in haste, turned to engage, and thus rammed the Austrian plane out of the sky. Both Austrian pilots, and Nesterov, died in the clash. And trust me when I say this, this won't be the last ram attack you see in First World War air battles. But wait! There's war! Hang on to your seat, baby! October 5, 1914, Sergeant Franz and Corporal and Gunner Louis Quinault are flying a recon mission in a Voisin 3, and encounter a German aviatic piloted by Fritz von Zangen and Wilhelm Schlichting. After two strips from his machine gun, Quinault strikes the engine of the German aircraft, causing it to plummet into a field in Reims, 
and achieves the first air-to-air -air kill of the war that doesn't involve reckless, and frankly retarded, suicide. Weeks later, most countries started putting machine guns atop unarmed one-man aircraft, but the obvious issues arose of pilots standing up to aim at the target to shoot, and then their plane doing, well, that. Another issue which began to arise was pilots fixing machine guns on the nose, but all well forgetting there is this magical thing called a rotor the plane needs to stay airborne, and if your gun is firing as it's spinning, you're gonna have a real bad time. Um. But don't worry the French are here to save us, French manufacturer Raymond Saulnier and French chronic liar Roland Garros began their work on an influential project, a synchronizer, which basically via some tubes and wire ensured the gun wouldn't shoot the rotors off. Simple in practice, but it was far from perfect at this stage. See, the first prototype required a metal propeller so in the event of a misfire, it wouldn't rip the prop off. There was also noted issues that the bullet could sometimes ricochet into the engine block, 10 out of 10 engineering. But enough dissing on the French for now, because Garo went on to become the first ace in history with three air kills, one on April Fools, the 15th and 18th of April. He claimed he shot down a Zeppelin too, but that's where the liar bit comes to play, he never did. What he did do however, was get shot down by German anti-air on the 18th, and he and his plane were captured. On average it took anti-air 50 plus shots to hit something. I could do a vid about this guy. But long story short, he fled a German prisoner of war camp in 1918, got back into the French Air Force and then got shot dead in a dogfight against Hermann Habicht. However, the French weren't the only ones making this device, Dutch turncoat Anthony Fokker was well at work helping Germany develop one as well. His design was more or less the same as the French prototype had been, but it actually worked. They equipped new machine guns that were lighter, but had the ability to melt often and usually melt into the exhausts of the engine, but hey, at least the propeller isn't mincemeat. And oh god almighty, when he unveiled the Fockery one, shit was going to get real real fast. The British were working on a system as well, but it took a bit longer. Instead, the British had either Lewis gun-armed Vickers Skybuses or Beck 2s which were in large use. Both were used as multi-role aircraft, but both lacked any meaningful defense against enemy fighters. On August 1, 1915, a sortie of Beck 2s raided a German Air Force base, and kicked the mother of all hornets' nests. thing is, shooting a moving target is a real pain in the ass and damn near impossible, the British pilots however, were only manned by one man, as they needed extra space for the bomb load, so the only firearms they had on them were either handguns or rifles, both of which required them to quit flying for a second to defend themselves against planes which just had to tail them in their blind spots and light them up like there was no tomorrow. 
E3-15 Bolka and E13-15 Immelman took to the skies in pursuit of the British aircraft, Bolka had a gun jam, but Immelman blew one plane out of the sky and wounded the pilot of another. In the coming months, what became known as the Fokker Scourge saw German aircraft absolutely dominate the skies uncontested scoring over 140 kills on British aircraft and countless more on the French. In London, politicians grew hostile over the inaction to do anything to remedy German air superiority, one politician claiming they were not sending their pilots out there to be killed, but more so murdered. And unlike British scout planes, German Fokker or p sorties always came in pairs, so even if you thought you escaped the one, his buddy is going to be right on your ass at all times. Sure, the Skybus had a frontal gun, but what good will that do you if the guys trying to murder you are tailing your rear? The Beck 2 for the last bit of its service life started to enforce pilots to take gunners in the rear seat, and even then, it was a chore to ward off enemy fighters pursuing you. Adam Savage and Peter Jackson via Discovery posted a cool video showing how your average pursuit was, I will post the link to the full video in the description, trust me it's a watch. God bless that magnificent Kiwi, gave us the Lord of the Rings movies and an accurate depiction of Try Not To Die Simulator 1915 edition. The Fokker Exposed. Score a non-lethal hit on one of the Fokker's wings. I need to hit the engine or pilot sensors to get a kill shot. The Fokker is right back on our tail, scoring non-lethal hits on our wings and fuselage. We're sitting ducks. Gary puts the RE-8 through evasive maneuvers. We've shaken the Fokker, but now we have no idea where he is. Fokker goes in for the kill. Coming up behind. The indicator light signals a human hit. I'm a gun. But it looks like I got one good shot off before I bought it. I, I think we got it. You got him? Yeah, he's if you had a tail gunner with experience, it, out, it was Fox very common the for the gunner time. and the it's enemy it. pilot to bite the bullet. It was the deadly trait of life in the air war, or alternatively you could just ram the enemy plane or slow down so you fall on him. Suicide gets them every time. However, in 1916, tides were turning, 
and much to the dismay of German high command a Fokker landed at a British airbase thinking they were in Germany, the tech was reverse engineered and in pretty much an instant the balance of power changed. There were earlier cases of British pilots one-upping Fokkers, like Major Lano Hawker, who with a Lewis gun fixed to the side of his Bristol Scout, managed to take out a German recon plane and two Fokkers single-handedly in 1915, sending German high command into a blurring spit of rage that one of the worst scout planes of the British Air Force outside the Beck 2B2 of their best aircraft. When the un Tom began to reverse engineer all the juicy German tech, the Fokker scourge died out not with a roar, but with a whimper, as Entente Air Forces could outcontend and outproduce the supply-starving little goblins of the German Empire. And with balance of power now shifted, pretty much all Ludendorff could do was cry and whine about other people not being responsible for his fuck-ups. I mean, it was either that, or blame the Jews for something, take your pick with this guy. Now this isn't to say dogfighting immediately became a professional and precise practice, it just meant that people spam shit at each other and bodies pile up more because now there isn't one side with the tactical advantage. A neat tactic that was put into practice ASAP was to debate two-seaters and just climb in the direction of the sun, the tail gunner can't see you, and when he looks into the sun like a special ed student you plummet down onto them and turn them into steaming hot Swiss cheese. From this point forwards in the war, if a recon or bomber unit went out, they always had escorts, and where there was escorts, there was flights deployed to stop the attack in general, it was basically the world's most dangerous game of protect the VIP. If you went out early morning or late afternoon for recon runs and you didn't have any support, you were dead meat if you were not back over friendly lines by the time interceptors arrived, watch this gun cam footage, you can see the French planes swarm the German scout, it tries to shoot back, but it really doesn't matter at the end. Both German pilots died after the final strafe, which appears to have struck the pilot, and the plane simply crashed as a result. I know this has been 20 minutes of me making fun of an otherwise serious life or death trade with high stakes no matter which way you turn, so before I continue, I will establish that these pilots truly risked hell and high water with what they did, and participated in single-handedly the worst trade of the war aside from being a trench raider or you boat crewman. However, it is these flaws, and the final ones I intend to conclude this with, that cemented the basis for which modern military aviation to grow into the spastic child we know it as today. Here's a great example of things that didn't age well. Training carts, so you could move and shoot targets on the move. Think that's normal? While the carts often derailed at about the same speed of your aircraft will be flying, you were absolutely expected to crawl yourself back to home base as if you went down behind enemy lines, yeah you try getting up after getting chucked nearly 200 kilometers an hour into the dirt. We all know what a parachute is right? 
Yeah, after 1915 to 1916, they started issuing these to pilots in their planes. You may be wondering, well what's so mean worthy about this? Well dear viewer, it was considered an act of cowardice in 90% of cases to use your chute. You were expected to go down with your plane like a navy captain would with his ship, so death was usually absolute. <laughs> That is, unless you fake your downing story and make it sound like you survived the crash and totally didn't deploy your chute. Like Herman Goring. <laughs>